So now we're going to talk about disorders of bone and mineral metabolism in the context of CKD, but first it's worth reviewing the physiology just because this can be um, you know, a really complex topic and it's uh, one thing a lot of you know, residents don't understand or get a lot of teaching on, so I do think it's worth reviewing the physiology. So we're going to spend most of our time talking about calcium and phosphorus, um, and even though the vast majority, like greater than 99% of total body calcium is located in bones, it's still a pretty uh, important cation in both the intracellular and extracellular fluid. So um, as you know, we hold the serum calcium concentration in a very narrow range. And we do that because it has an important role in uh, nerve impulse transmission, uh, muscle contraction, uh, coagulation of blood, hormone secretion, uh, cellular signaling, and intracellular adhesion. So because of all these things, uh, we do have a very robust system for keeping the calcium in a, a very narrow range. So the most important piece of uh, calcium balance regulation comes at the level of the parathyroid gland. So here's the, this pink thing is the thyroid gland, but these four, you know, kind of hot pink dots uh, represent the parathyroid glands. So uh, parathyroid glands have this receptor, the CASR, the calcium sensing receptor. So they care about calcium concentrations. And so in response to a low serum calcium concentration, low ionized calcium, since that's the, the physiologic calcium um, that we see, remember uh, nearly half of uh, intravascular calcium is actually uh, protein bound or complex to other things. But the ionized calcium that is low, right, it will stimulate the secretion of PTH or parathyroid hormone. So PTH really wants to... Uh, restore the ionized calcium back to normal. So in the setting of a low ionized calcium, we need to uh, go to the bank essentially. So PTH will go to our bone, which contains a lot of um, calcium. And so PTH receptors on osteoblasts get stimulated. And in turn, uh, they help increase osteoclast number and osteoclast activity, which results in bone resorption. So the crystal structure of bone is actually hydroxyapatite, which contains both calcium and phosphorus. So as you resorb bone, you release both calcium and phosphorus uh, into the extracellular fluid. And so this is one way PTH restores calcium concentrations back to normal. Next, parathyroid hormone goes to the kidney. So here it stimulates um, upregulation of a 1-alpha hydroxylase. So this enzyme is important because it converts the inactive vitamin D, so 25-hydroxy vitamin D is inactive, to the active version, 1,25 vitamin D, also known as calcitriol. So calcitriol will act on increasing dietary calcium and phosphorus by interacting with our gastrointestinal system. So calcium is reabsorbed along the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum of uh, Phosphate uh, seems to be mostly uh, absorbed along the duodenum and jejunum. And so under the action of calcitriol, it'll go to enterocytes, and the active transport of calcium is increased. So increased dietary calcium reabsorption as well as increased phosphorus reabsorption. Thus, remember, the entire cascade was uh, prompted by uh, low calcium concentrations that resulted in PTH, now we've made more calcitriol, and we're bringing in more calcium in from the diet. Next, uh, PTH has uh, extra effects on the kidney, especially with regards to uh, transport across tubules. So under the action of PTH, calcium reabsorption is increased, um, and this occurs in the more distal segments of the tubule. So in the distal convoluted tubule, um, active transport of calcium is increased and that will increase uh, calcium reabsorption. Um, in addition, phosphorus reabsorption is decreased. So there are sodium phosphate transporters in the proximal tubule. Under the action of PTH, um, these transporters are ex uh, expressed to um, a lesser degree, so expression decreases. And so with fewer transporters, you start spilling more phosphorus in the urine. So it will cause phosphaturia, so loss of phosphate, increased excretion. So it's interesting to note that um, so far, you know, calcium and phosphorus were going in the same direction from bone and from the gut, but here they're going in the opposite direction. We're reabsorbing calcium while increasing excretion of phosphorus. So it should be noted in another layer. So there's another layer of control here. Um, low calcitriol concentrations 
will also stimulate uh, parathyroid glands to secrete parathyroid hormone. In casitriol itself, exerts a negative regulation on PTH. So uh, casitriol will inhibit PTH secretion. So this forms a nice uh, negative feedback loop. But um, keep in mind, if calcitriol concentrations are very low, uh, PTH will be stimulated. So think about it. Everything we've done so far um, acted to increase serum calcium concentrations. And you're right, PTH did have this effect at increasing phosphate excretion, but we actually have another uh, hormone called FGF23 that's going to help regulate phosphorus, okay? So in response to increased serum phosphorus, so hyperphosphatemia, it will actually stimulate uh, osteoblasts in the bone to secrete this hormone, FGF23. So what does FGF23 do? So FGF23 is going to work to keep phosphorus concentrations in the normal range, and it's going to work hard to prevent hyperphosphatemia and a positive phosphate balance. And so how does it do that? Well, um, it acts as a negative regulator of PTH, so it will inhibit PTH secretion, and it also will inhibit this 1-alpha hydroxylase. Remember, this is uh, being stimulated to convert inactive vitamin D into active vitamin D or calcitriol. So FGF23 will downregulate this 1-alpha hydroxylase. It also upregulates a 24-hydroxylase that will basically form an inactive uh, version of vitamin D, a 24-25 vitamin D. Um, so only the 125 or calcitriol is the active version that has this effect on the gut. So uh, basically FGF23 is working as a negative regulator uh, to calcitriol. Thus, it makes a lot of sense that calcitriol actually regulates its own production by going back here and stimulating FGF23. Also, FGF23 has very strong effects in the tubules at increasing phosphate excretion. So um, similar to the actions of PTH, FGF23 will downregulate the sodium phosphate transporter in the proximal tubules. Therefore, the filtered phosphate, instead of being reabsorbed, is lost in the urine. So it increases phosphate excretion or phosphaturia. And so um, an alternative name for FTO23 is that it's a phosphaturic hormone. And this is what they mean by that. It will increase phosphate excretion, um, thus bringing phosphate concentrations back down to normal. All right, so what's happening with CKD? So um, in general, remember, CKD is associated with a, a low GFR. So as we lose our GFR, I want you to just think about the main inciting event here is phosphate retention. Because remember, um, you know, phosphate regulation, yes, uh, some comes in from the diet, uh, but our method of excretion is through the kidney. So we need to excrete uh, through uh, glomerular filtration and by um, either increasing or decreasing tubular reabsorption of phosphate. So um, as we lose GFR, we lose our ability to excrete phosphate. And so chronic retention of phosphate is key here because, remember, as phosphorus is retained, it will stimulate this hormone, right? It stimulates FGF23, which is being released from the bone, okay? And remember, FGF23 has a number of other effects. Remember, with FGF secretion, it will inhibit PTH, but it also inhibits the uh, metabolism of calcitriol. So it will inhibit uh, production of calcitriol. And essentially, uh, patients with CKD will develop uh, severe calcitriol deficiencies because this pathway is blocked. So because of a calcitriol deficiency, uh, patients will develop essentially hypocalcemia. And also, um, I did mention this earlier, but with phosphate retention, remember phosphorus and calcium like to stick together so they can form complexes. So with retained phosphate, calcium and phosphate can start complexing and actually the ionized calcium, which is the physiologic calcium, the calcium sensing receptor cares about, um, will be decreased. So um, high phosphorus and low calcitriol levels will stimulate PTH production. Now, I know earlier we said that FGF23 will inhibit um, uh, the release of PTH, but apparently with chronic kidney disease, um, the overall balance of these effects is such that there's actually a resistance to this FGF23 inhibition that occurs. And overall, um, the low calcitriol hypocalcemia 
stimulation of uh, PTH uh, sort of predominates. So this release of PTH in the setting of chronic kidney disease is what we call secondary hyperparathyroidism, okay? And so um, this is essentially the mechanism that's occurring. So in a patient with CKD, um, they're retaining phosphate. FGF23 levels are elevated, and at later stages, PTH uh, levels are elevated. And so kind of what's happening behind the scenes at earlier stages of CKD is that with phosphate retention, you know, FGF23 is increased, and all these things are occurring just to keep the serum phosphate within normal limits. So um, there is a sort of a stages of increased phosphaturia that are occurring uh, to prevent um, hyperphosphatemia. Then at later stages of CKD, you start to see uh, hyperphosphatemia. Um, and of course, uh, by that point, castle trial levels are very low, PTH is high, and FGF23 levels are very high. So most importantly, you may be wondering, why, why do we even care about any of this? And so um, overall, I know this is a complex system, but I, I do think it's, um, it's, it's really elegant how our body regulates calcium and phosphorus such that, um, remember at the beginning I mentioned how calcium um, really serves a, a vital role in addition to, to being involved in um, bone, but it also has this role in nerve and pulse transmission, uh, muscle contraction, uh, coagulation, hormone secretion, intracellular signaling. So, so we really care about uh, calcium concentrations, and uh, our body has many mechanisms to keep the calcium um, concentration within a very narrow range, right? So that's something that we're working hard to do. But also, we really work hard to avoid phosphate retention. We have uh, a couple of different mechanisms to keep phosphorus levels uh, low enough so that we don't get into trouble. And uh, what do I mean by trouble? Well, I mean, think about it. We have uh, calcium in our intravascular fluid, but if we start retaining phosphate, uh, we know that calcium and phosphorus like to stick together. And so when they stick together, um, you know, the easiest thing to think about is bone. So when calcium and phosphate stick together, they form complexes, and this can promote uh, tissue calcification. So we do know that uh, hyperphosphatemia, phosphate retention, cause vascular calcification. So this is a big problem for our patients with advanced CKD and then our patients with ESRD. So as you can imagine, vascular calcification, um, if it's in your heart, it causes coronary artery disease. If it's anywhere else, it's peripheral arterial disease. Um, it can lead to strokes. Um, and so uh, many of our patients with CKD, they have a very high burden of cardiovascular disease, and that's the leading cause of death. So um, we believe that uh, among other variables, um, phosphate retention, as well as disordered bone and mineral metabolism and vascular calcification is one major, major um, role in the uh, pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease. In addition, um, FGF23 itself seems to have effects on the heart, um, especially in driving uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, so a big, thick um, uh, left ventricle here, which can lead to, obviously, a non-compliant ventricle, uh, diastolic heart failure, sudden cardiac death. So this is the milieu that we're trying to correct, and um, vascular calcification and LVH, all driven by phosphate retention and uh, hormonal imbalance, secondary hyperparathyroidism, and FGF23. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting work being done here to try and um, downregulate these systems and uh, improve outcomes for our patients. In addition, um, you know, hyperparathyroidism can result also in a uh, bone disease. So we collectively call it renal osteodystrophy, but, you know, actually it's a, a mix of different types of bone diseases. You know, one of them is called a dynamic bone disease. A uh, patient can develop osteomalacia. A uh, patient can develop a low turnover form of osteomalacia or another disease called osteitis fibrosa or mixed uremic osteodystrophy. So a number of different things can happen, but essentially this can result in uh, bone pain uh, or even increased fracture risk. So that's another reason for why we care about uh, bone or min mineral disease and um, you know controlling these things. Supported by the William and Sandra Bennett Clinical Scholars Program and the American Society of Nephrology.